Thank you for downloading this podcast from the Forum for Philosophy. Subscribe for weekly discussions of science, culture, politics and the arts from a philosophical perspective. The Forum is a non-profit organisation and our events are free and open to all. You can support our work via our website and Facebook page. Welcome to this Forum for Philosophy event on the theme of nature versus nurture. Debates about nature and nurture are common in the sciences, and they're common in everyday life too. But it can sometimes be a bit puzzling to get to grips with what these debates are about. We have genes, we have environment. We know that genes and the environment both matter to human behavior, a crude kind of genetic determinism in which we're just programmed by the genome and there's nothing we can do about it, is universally rejected. And a kind of blank slate view on which the genome contributes absolutely nothing to human traits or human behavior is widely rejected too. And yet debates about nature and nurture don't seem to go away. What we'll be talking about in this event is what these debates are really about and what scientific issues are really at the core of them and that explain their persistence. And we'll also be thinking about the future of nature and nurture and how relatively new ideas like epigenetics and cultural evolution have complicated the relationship between nature and nurture and genes and the environment so that it's no longer clear whether genes and environment is, is the whole story about human behavior at all. I'm delighted to be joined by three panelists who are coming to these topics of nature and nurture from very different directions and have very interesting perspectives to bring to bear. They're Tom Dickens from uh, Middlesex University, specialist in behavioral biology. Sophie von Stumm from University of York, specialist in psychology and education. And Eva Yablonka from Tel Aviv University, an evolutionary biologist well known for her work on epigenetics. So let's start with uh, you, Sophie. I mean, let's think about debates about nature and nurture and, and what they're really about. If everyone agrees that human behavior is explained by genes and environment and they both matter, why is it still such a source of controversy? Well, I think ultimately it's a, it's a controversy because of what um, people interpret heritability or genetic influence to mean. Um, heritability means the proportion of differences between people that we can observe in a trait um, that can be attributed to their genetic differences. So if you think about height, we all have different heights. And uh, we can ask how much of the differences between us and height are due to genetic factors, and that would be heritability. And we can ask the same question about our psychological differences. Um, how happy we are, how anxious we are, how smart we are. Um, and that's usually when it starts to get a little bit iffy um, to think about genetic influences on these things because there is this assumption that if it's genetic, it is fixed and it is a determinant, which of course is not true, but it's something that always moves in the room as an idea for interpreting genetic influences. So when people talk about height, you know, it seems uncontroversial. No, no one has a blank slate view of height, right? that your height is just totally determined by your social environment. Yet we know a lot of environmental factors that influence height. If you are, uh, um, suffer malnutrition in early life, if you grow up in, in uh, abusive homes, if you're hit, um, these are all things that affect your height. So there are environmental influences on height, just like there are environmental influences on any other trait. But that picture in which genes and environment interact seems really uncontroversial for height. But then if we move to something like sort of educational attainment, something like that, suddenly we've, we've found a trait where just talking about genetic influence seems to be controversial. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you want to tell us a bit about some of your work in, uh, in sort of trying to understand the mixes of nature and nurture when it comes to a trait like educational attainment. You're throwing me in at the deep end here, are you? Um, yes, I will tell you something about it. So um, 
What we've known in genetic research for a long time now is that psychological traits are heritable. So all psychological traits are under genetic influence. And we know this from twin studies. In twin studies, we compare the resemblance of monozygotic twins who are genetic clones, so they share 100% of their genes, to the resemblance of dizygotic twins. Those share, on average, 50% of their segregating genes, and they're genetically as similar as just normal siblings. They're more similar in the way that they grow up at the same time in the same room. And these twin studies are like a, a classic way of trying to disentangle nature and nurture. This is the classic way of studying heritability or estimating the proportion of variance, the proportions of differences between people that is due to genetic factors. And what has become possible more recently is that we can look at DNA directly. So we can look at a person's genetic propensity for a psychological trait or for height or for any other dimension that you want to talk about. And that's really um, a revolution because it allows us to study the interplay between genetics and environment more directly. We no longer have to make an indirect inference on the basis of group comparisons, i.e. the basis of comparing two types of twins. But we can take a person, we can ask how much education have you had, and we can take that person's genotype and then test if there's a relationship between genotype differences and educational achievement differences. And what have you found? Well, what we have found is that that actually works. So we can, by now, use DNA observed in people to predict about 16% of their differences in GCSE grades. So that 16% of the variance of the differences between children in school in GCSE performance. And you might say 16% is much, right? Because <laughs> that leaves 84% unaccounted. And that is the vast majority. It's absolutely true. But you have to consider that only about half of the differences between in children's school performance are due to genetic factors to begin with. So we would say that about 50% of children's differences in school performance are thought to be heritable. And that we know from twin studies. So if you have 16%, but it is all that is genetic, you have to change the reference. And so you actually have a third of the variants that is genetic discovered with our methods today in studying DNA. And our methods are very, very fast developing, but they're still rudimentary in the way that as we are progressing, um, we will be able to um, identify more and more DNA variants that are associated with education achievement, and we can use them to predict. Could you give, the, give us a sense of what the methods are? You know, it, is it about lots and lots of DNA samples? It is about lots and lots of DNA samples in the way that um, what, what you do is you run a so-called genome-wide association study where you have uh, ideally millions of people who have uh, offered their genotype and they have given you some information about how much education they've had. And what you then do is you compare those DNA variants that differ between us. They're called single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs. And you test across the genome in this massive sample which of these SNPs is associated with differences in educational achievement. What you will find in a study like this is that there are thousands of SNPs that are associated with differences. So thousands of, of genes that are, that are individually very weakly associated. Of DNA variants. They're not really genes because genes are sequences of DNA variants. Um, but here we're just really talking about one base pair. So if you think about the DNA and you, you think about the double helix, that ladder, it's one rung of the ladder. That's what we're looking at. So here. right at the molecular level, yes. it's one little bit. One tiny, tiny little bit. And we have six, six billion base pairs. So that means you need a lot of statistical power in order to identify one of these base pairs that is associated with the trait that you're interested in. And this is just step one, because then what you see is there are thousands of these DNA variants or SNPs associated. And what you can do then is say, I'm going to take that information and go to a different sample where I have people with their DNA, so genotyped participants and their school grades or something, and I'm going to use the result of the genome-wide association study as a sort of blueprint to add together their DNA variants and compute a score, which is then called a genome-wide polygenic score, that is person-specific. It's a person-specific estimate of your genetic propensity to do well in education, and you can then use that as a predictor. So it's amazing stuff. It's a six billion base pairs, you know, little bits of DNA, and you're 
trying to find you know, a few thousand that you can then link statistically to things like GCSE results. Mm -hmm. I mean, is it fair to say that the upshot of this is that it looks as though educational performance might be a bit more like height than we might have thought? You know, perhaps with height, it's the other way around, that genetic factors explain the vast majority of the variants, whereas in, in this case, maybe the genetic factors only explain a little bit. But in both cases, we've got some of the differences perhaps being explained genetically and some of the differences being explained <coughs> environmentally. And that, that is certainly a similarity, although I, I would have to say, of course, genetic influences on height on average tend to be much higher than genetic influences estimated on psychological yeah. traits, in particular on yeah. educational achievement. And so the genetic influence on height is, is much stronger. Yes, and we would also speculate that the mechanisms um, that drive the interplay between genetics and environment are likely not to be the same uh, for height as for educational achievement because educational achievement is so much more strongly influenced by social environmental variables that we know, um, whereas height, although it is environmentally influenced, it has less to do with how well your parents talk to you or how often they send you to a piano lesson if you will grow tall. So you're, I mean, you're kind of on the front line of the science of nature and nurture, Really. I mean, what, what do you see the use of this science as being? You talked about the aim as being a predictive aim. What, what do you see as the main aim? Well, prediction allows us to identify risk and resilience. And um, if you think about risk, uh, if you think about uh, children being at risk for poor academic outcomes, it might be helpful to identify those children early before they actually have the problems to intervene successfully. So if you know that you're at risk for, um, let's say, a learning disability, you might get earlier tutoring, you might um, start children off with a different curriculum, you might personalize their learning in order to meet their personal learning needs. So it's about risk factors, you know, like you might look for risk factors for, for cancer, for other diseases. Well, now we're shifting field from education, but yes, we can use it in, in the prediction of medical outcomes too. That's actually one of the biggest fields in uh, genetics today or in genomics, the use of genome-wide polygenic mm. scores to predict um, the risk of cardiovascular disease, so for you're example. you're sort of taking that, that method that's used to try and predict heart disease and things like that. So yes. well, maybe we can also predict psychological problems with this too. Yes, you can do both. And in, in medicine, um, it's probably more intuitive in terms of how that would be helpful to identify that risk because if you discovered that you were genetically at the greatest risk for, let's say, breast cancer, um, you might get uh, a screening more often if you know that your probability is higher, and we might implement that to make um, the National Health Service more efficient, because you don't have to screen everyone, but you have to screen the ones at the increased risk at a higher frequency to make sure that they get the support that they need in the medical care. I mean, Edward, I'd like to bring, in, bring you on this, if, if I can, that What's your reaction to this, and why, why do you think research that is aimed at trying to disentangle nature and nurture for psychological traits is, is as controversial as it is? Well, I want to think, I would like to, us to think about the 66% or the 50% when the methods will become better that are not, uh, that are not due to variations in DNA. DNA is always important, but variations in DNA are not always important for, for understanding why we have a variation in traits. So when I'm thinking about, or each of us is thinking about uh, what we are and why we are the way we are, we think about inputs into our development. And there are genetic inputs into our development. There are differences in genes that make a difference mm -hmm. in, what, in, in our appearance, in what we are, in our personalities. There are epigenetic differences, and epigenetic is the way that genes are expressed. So we can have, two people can have the same gene, but in one person it will be expressed, in another it will not be expressed, for, what, for many, many different reasons. It could be due to chance, and it could be due to some kind of environmental uh, reason, some kind of environmental induction. Then we have to think about the womb environment. There are experiments in mice that, are sh uh, that have shown very, very nicely that the, uh, that the womb in which a mouse develops 
if it, if it is transplanted into a, into a womb of a, um, a mouse of a very different strain, it develops differently. So the kind of cocktail of hormones and other factors that are in the womb are also affecting development. And then there is the, the microbiome. The environment starts early. Yeah. Very, the, very the early. The environment as being other, other people. Very, very early. Mm. And we are learning more and more about it. Not, uh, it starts, in fact, from the oocyte, from the, uh, from the egg cell and from the sperm. Mm. What, what, what the reason the egg cell and the sperm, which has been affected by the, de- by, by the development of the parents, is also affecting the development of the offspring. Then we have uh, early, condition, uh, early care. Yes, how much care does one get? What kind of food does one, is one exposed to? The, the, uh, the milk. In, milk is not only a source of food, it's also a source of information. It is something that determines some food preferences. We have the microbiome, which we acquire from the mother, but also from the from the environment. You say what the microbiome Microbiome is, is the kind of uh, bacteria in our mm. gut, which are very, very important for, for development, including, as we surprisingly find, also cognitive development. So the environment doesn't even have to be outside the body? No, uh, it, in, is, in the, it is within the bed. Yeah. It, it is, first of all, the environment in which we are, it's the environment in which we are developing, starting in the womb of the mother. And then we have the great mother of all, yes, the culture in which we live. So all these things are inputs into our development. And everybody knows it. Every biologist knows these things. Mm. And there is no controversy about it. So what is the controversy? The controversy is whether these things affect not only the individual, but also its progeny. Whether these are her- whether this inputs can lead to heritable effects, whether these inputs can lead to evolutionary effects. I think that today the nature-nurture uh, controversy, I don't know if you agree with me, but the way that I see it is couched today in terms of which factors are really important for heredity and for evolution. Are these only genetic factors or are they also the other kinds of inputs into development that I have been talking about, which I say, yes, they are important because each and every one of them can affect heredity and, more controversially, can affect evolution. Okay, so, I mean, everyone agrees environment matters in the, in the short term, you know, in, in the lifetime of an individual. But you think one of the, the remaining controversies is whether the environment kind of matters over the long term because it's part of inheritance, it's part of heredity. Yes. Inheritance is not purely about genetics. Yes, I think so. I mean, let's bring in uh, Tom and your perspective on this. I mean, you're you're, uh, coming to this debate from an interesting direction because a lot of your work is focused on birds, right? uh, Currently, yes, yeah. (laughs) But people debate nature and nurture in birds as well. It's not just a debate about humans. Well, um... Ernst Mayer famously said that birds were a very good model organism to actually have these discussions about because we know so much about the approximately 10,000 species of birds that there are on the planet mm. and we know much about their developmental biology, not, not, not the totality in any sense. So we can kind of come um, very readily equipped to the organism to then start to try and tease out these, these particular um, questions. But, um, but directly responding to what Eva's just mm. said... Um, I, th- I think that's kind of a very accurate description and a very accurate account of where the controversy is. It's in the evolutionary theory end of things rather than in the idea that there are systems that take inputs. It's, it's not the only controversy, though, is it? Because, Sophie, you were also alluding to the idea that people get very worried about the idea that if you show there's a genetic component in some trait, that means it's fixed. So there's, there's part of it that's about control, isn't there? We, we fear... If we show a genetic component in some trait, then it means we lose control. We can no longer influence the trait. The educational outcomes or something like that are just fixed and there's nothing we can do about them. And then that gets very controversial too. Sophie? Well, I think it's, that it, it's a huge mistake in interpretation. So when, when we talk about genetic uh, influences, 
For psychological traits, what we mean is genetic propensities. These are tendencies, these are probabilities. Some people find it easier to learn in school. That doesn't mean that those who find it hard shouldn't go to school. It's just easier for some of us. It's sort of like rolling a dice. You might think that a dice, if it's biased, it has a propensity to land on six or something like that. But it doesn't mean it always will. You're playing with funny dice. I thought they were supposed to be... um, The odds were supposed to be the same yeah, to loaded, turn on a loaded one. A loaded one. Um, but ultimately, yes. So you have, a, you have a propensity, you have a probability for finding something easier or harder, and uh, you will behave accordingly. Um, the best example for that is always weight. Um, weight is highly heritable. Most people only think height is heritable, but actually weight is highly heritable. And that doesn't mean that if you have fatty genes, you need to be fat. But it is much harder for you to resist food. It's much harder to lose weight. It's much harder to get off the sofa and do exercise. That doesn't mean that it has to be. Smoking is another one. Smoking is heritable under genetic influence. I loved smoking. One of my favorite things in life. (laughs) I learned it's not good for me. And I gave up. Yet, I will still crave it when somebody smokes next to me. I'm thinking, oh, good old days. I wish I could do it. It's not a determinant. It's a propensity. It makes me more likely to do it, even though I know it's not So you've exerted control. You know, but these facts about genetic influence, they tell us something about how difficult or easy it might be to control something. That, that's why it can be very worrying, this research, sometimes. Yeah, I just want to give an uh, example of a very nice experiment that was done, in fact, in, in Britain, in Cambridge. And in this experiment, the uh, people looked at uh, mice that had a mutation in a gene which affects memory. And uh, so they compared it to normal mice that did not have this mutation, and there was a difference in the way that they could remember and learn new things. And then they took the mice with, the, with this mutation and and grew them in an enriched environment, in an environment where the mouse was not just living in the normal, very boring cage, but was really having a lot of fun. It it was having all kinds of toys, and it was doing all kinds of things, and it was running around and doing stuff. And then, after they they took, after they they looked at how this uh, this, uh, mouse performed and how its offspring performed uh, in the memory test, And they were like normal mice. So in spite of the fact that we had here a mutation that affected memory and learning, it was possible through environmental Mm -hmm. uh, condition, through a change in the environment, to mask the effects of this mutation and make this mice perform exactly like normal control mice. And and also, interestingly, also their offspring. Mm -hmm. We don't know exactly what happened there, what the mechanism is, but this is a very so good it's often experiment. It's possible to make an environmental intervention that will actually counteract the effect of exactly. genes. Exactly. Well, this is a great example of a gene-environment interaction where you have a genetic expression that differs depending on the environment that, um, in this case, the mouse is in. And we're trying to understand how that would work for humans too, but it is very, very complicated because, as I said before, um, our psychological traits are not influenced by one genetic variant but by many thousands. So to systematically select someone who carries one and put them into a different environment and study them is much more difficult in humans, although we have examples for single gene disorders where we do exactly the same. For example, we know of uh, genetic mutations that babies carry, and if you alter their diet... Um, that genetic mutation won't lead um, to unfavorable outcomes. So you're you're changing the environment, and with that you influence how that genetic factor is expressed. Yes. Well, I guess one one thing I sort of would like to throw into the pot, so there's no sense of counter to what's being said um, just now, but is that there's a, there's a danger when you have these kinds of conversations of um, almost separating out the nature from the nurture which in itself can kind of lead to another sort of controversy, which is to begin to see them as in some sense oppositional. But actually, one of the things that kind of concerns me and a lot of people in my my world um, is that you'd expect developmental processes and um, physiological and behavioural processes to be patterned in a way that makes sense for the underlying genome. So there's going to be a, a connection here. This goes to an old evolutionary argument, which is still very much used about 
the idea in a, in a way that your genome is a kind of a historical relic from your evolutionary past and it's not really <coughs> designed precisely for where you are now and maybe a potentially risky environment or changeable environment. So a great solution to that is to build in mechanisms yeah. that are essentially plastic that enable you to respond to certain so kinds of data. Some of that flexibility in response to the environment is itself influenced by the genome. Well, the, the, effectively, the idea that an organism might have a developmental process mm. is, is ultimately a kind of genetic evolutionary decision yeah. in order to make that organism robust in a stochastic or a risky kind of changeable environment. Um, so where you see that it's actually a solution to maintaining the integrity of the organism. And this gets you very close to philosophical definitions of what life, in fact, might be, where there's more complexity within the organism to deal with what is without. Um, but if you don't think about it, if you kind of, and I'm not in any sense saying you guys are doing this, but if you kind of list lots of developmental effects and try and see them as sort of separate, you kind of miss that hookup. Mm. And there's a whole... Um, the raft of evolutionary theory, life history theory, which is sort of where I locate myself part of the time, that is trying to understand how that calibration might be designed mm. itself in order to service... How the genes might evolve to allow more environmental There are genes for development. You know, development isn't yeah. just a, a thing that's magically imposed on, a, on an organism. Mm. So it seems like part of the problem here with nature and nurture is that people hear in the, in the news or whatever that some trait has a genetic component, whether it's obesity or height, or educational achievement, and then they think that means that there's no way to intervene on the environment to change that, when in fact that, that inference is completely wrong. And presumably, Sophie, completely wrong in the case of educational achievement, that, that in fact uh, there being these genetic risk factors is, is entirely compatible with improving things like IQ and measures like that just, just by improving schools and improving the environment that children are, are being educated in. Yeah. yeah, I totally blame Mendel for the state of affairs. Um, uh, That's a bit harsh. No, 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 no I'm serious. The, the Austrian monk who discovered the laws of inheritance initially um, and he conducted experiments with pea plants and he studied seven discrete characteristics of pea plants, but he was the one that we all know about or that we're usually told about in school is the color. And so he discovered how the color of the pea plant seed is passed on across generations via mechanisms of inheritance. And we learn about this in school, and then we imagine that genetics is the same. And we're like, oh yeah, I'm either a green or a yellow pea plant, and I can't do much about it, right? Um, and we have to undo this and yeah. start thinking about genetics as something that consists of many, many factors that interact so with many environments. So to change the way genetics is taught, you think, to try and help people understand this? Yeah, I mean, don't blame the geneticists. They've been saying this for years, and so nobody listened the to them. I blame <laughs> Mendel. Mendel was a monk. I make a difference here. Um, to, to Behavioral be genetics has, has, has been a field that has been met with a lot of hostility and, and controversy uh, since the conception. But if you go back to 1918, Ronald Fisher actually was the first one to say that genetic differences are always quantitative, so there shall not be a single gene for any psychological trait that we're interested in. However, the empirical evidence, the actual demonstration, has only become possible in the past 20 years after the human genome was decoded. Is this ever? Yes, I just want to say one thing uh, related to the plasticity uh, point. It is clear that, for example, we have a wonderfully plastic brain, and uh, we can do a lot of things. Plastic in the sense and that the it's sort of in the moldable. Sense, moldable. Valuable. I mean, our, we are so different from each other in every sense, and, mm. uh, and, we can, and there are so many different cultures, and there are so many different social, uh, social structures, and so on and so forth. And it, is, and it is true, of course, that this plasticity of ours, this huge plasticity, behavioral plasticity, has a genetic basis. And it has evolved, and there was evolution for this plasticity. The question is, is there some kind of independent dimension, for example, of cultural evolution, where we don't have to say, okay, but it has evolved in the past for us to have a great, a huge brain. Is there a kind of axis of evolution which is mainly cultural. Nothing is purely this or that, but mainly cultural. Mm -hmm. And some of the disagreements 
about the role of different uh, non-genetic inheritance systems in evolution. And when I'm saying non-genetic, I mean the, genet the DNA variations do not make a difference uh, no. at, at the phenotypic level. The question is whether there is this semi-independent axis of evolution at the epigenetic level or at the cultural mm -hmm. level. This is one of the, I think, one of the controversies mm -hmm. within the field. Yeah, and that's where I was trying to, to get to. That yes. I think the controversy there is really around how you actually conceptualise what evolution is. That's right. And there's a lot, I mean, that's a long debate for another session, but that's... Mm -hmm. a, well, we'll come back to those issues about evolution in a moment. But it'd be great at this point to take a few questions from the audience. So this event is not just about the panel <laughs> talking to each other, but also taking questions from you. Uh, it would be great to take two or three questions, and there's one there from the third row. Um, what I'll do is take three questions at the same time. So as soon as you've asked your question, we'll go back to the third row from the back. Hi. Um, you've talked about intervention. So once you have knowledge of genes that affect, give you propensity for certain traits and so on, you can then intervene. Who gets to make the decision on what intervention you do based on what genetic information? So do parents get to choose intervention? if they are at risk of having a child with low education or being gay or having a dark skin or whatever. So yeah. do parents get to choose intervention? Do we have a list of things where people are allowed to intervene? And do children get to know the results of their genetic propensities? And how would that affect them if they know they are at risk of failing in schools? Doesn't that affect a child? It's a great question. We'll, we'll come back to the panel after taking another question from the third row from the back. Please wait for the microphone to come to you so that we can hear you. Um, I'm interested in uh, class in relation to this. Um, I heard recently that people of an upper middle class background are starting to marry people from the same background slightly more than they have done. Um, and in those cases you have not not only perhaps the advantage of genes, but also the environment. And what I'm interested in, does, does, might that tend to solidify, solidify, solidify their advantage over generations if that continues? Again, okay, a third question, if there is one. There's a question from just uh, five rows down there. And then, yep, and we'll take, uh, take that last question and then come back to the panel. Hi. Um, I'd like to propose a little thought experiment, if that's all right. Um, imagine you have two societies that don't know of each other, don't interact with each other, and genetically they're identical, but one society believes in genetic determinism. Mm. And because of that, they sort of let their genetic difference flourish because they think, you know, if, if my parents are overweight, there's nothing I can do about it, so I, I'll, I'll let myself do this. And another society maybe believes very strongly in blank slate theory, so because of this, they will work really, really hard to... I don't know, achieve their ideal weight or whatever example you want to. And because of this, you could see how the, the genetic influences on the observed behavior differs between the two societies purely because of what they believe about it. So if a scientist went in and tried to do twin study measurements, they would get different results. Mm. So, so in, to what degree is this actually a problem, that what we believe about genetics actually influences the findings we find about genetics? And, mm. yeah. Thanks. I mean, three excellent questions there. I mean, a question about how this information about risk factors for learning difficulties and things like that might affect the parent-child relationship. Do the children get access to the data? Do the parents, what is the parent allowed to do with the data if they have it? A question about how debates about nature and nurture interact with class and whether uh, sort of class is this mechanism for controlling the developmental environment. And the question about how beliefs in society and genetic determinism or in the black, blank slate actually interact with development in a way that might affect what we end up measuring. Um, so Sophie, would you like to respond to these first? Um, let, let's start with who knows about your DNA or who should know about it. Um, I think that's an urgent debate that we should have as a society. Um, currently, uh, this is a question of private commercial companies and your personal willingness to um, spit into a plastic tube and mail it off, pay 100 pounds, and then they will give you your genome back. 
they will also offer you some interpretations of what is in that genome. But you could take it yourself further, submit your genome elsewhere, and get feedback for it, including a genome-wide polygenic score for education, should you feel so inclined. Um, it is, at the moment, completely your choice what you do with it. And by virtue of our laws, it would be your choice as a parent what you do with this information about your child. Um, it will it is already um, a, a mass consumer product. Millions of people are doing this. Um, more and more people are doing it in the medical context. Um, and so it will become a reality for us. And I think we should, the opinions, if you um, share this information with children or not, uh, those drift apart. Um, I will point out that what we do today is that we let children know very well if they performed well or badly in school. And we make decisions about their future educational trajectories on the basis of their prior school performance. Genetics would just be a similar thing. Again, your prior school performance does not determine that you're going to be a good university student. But we infer a probability. We say if you did well in primary and secondary school, we assume you're more likely to do well at university, and that's why we make it easier for you to go. It's a question of responsibility, isn't there, there that you might think it's fair enough to use past exam results because the child was in some sense responsible for those results, whereas they weren't responsible for the genes they were born with. Oh, interesting. Now we are moving into the question of the just world. Did you, are you responsible for your school grades? To a greater extent than I'm, you know, <laughs> there's a certain degree of responsibility there that's not there for the Why genes. are you responsible for your grades? What makes you responsible? So they resulted from my own actions. Okay, and what if you went to a bad school and you had a poor teacher or your parents didn't love you at home? Is it your fault that you did badly at school? So there can be... Uh... That, that is, that, this, is, this, is, this is the point. Who is responsible for what? If it's genetic, are we all innocent because we didn't make it? Or is it our fault? <laughs> well, I mean, we're here to try and help answer those questions. <laughs> They're easy enough to ask. I think it's incredibly difficult. Um, so you don't agree that there's a sense in which one can be more responsible for something like you? No, no look, we, we all know that there's, there's a systematic family background inequality in education. With children coming from poor family backgrounds, they tend to go on average more often to bad schools and they tend to perform worse in GCSEs and that has a long-term knock-on effect on their rates of going to university and achieving a lot of educational qualifications. And education in our society tends to be the one thing that makes you have favorable life outcomes in the long run. If you have education, your probability of living longer, of living in a nice house, of living in an area without pollution, of having a car, of having a stable family is just much higher than if you don't have any educational qualifications. But kids are not responsible for their grades in that way. We do attribute this in our society because we say school grades, this is a consequence of how smart you are and how much you tried. And the trying part, we say it's your fault. If you didn't try, you don't deserve going to university. But guess what? Trying hard is as heritable as being smart. <laughs> mm. And I mean, it bears directly on that question of uh, how, how these issues interact with class, doesn't it? In intuitively, one might say that uh, genes have nothing to do with class, that, uh, that there's no correlation there, whether, whereas there, there, there may be in terms of access to educational resources and things like that. Well, that intuition is completely wrong. So family background is correlated with the genetic propensity for educational achievement. Um, kids who grow up in families where parents have performed well in educational systems tend to inherit their parents' genes for educational achievement, and so you have that correlation already in there. Parents who are educated and who have a good genetic propensity for education tend to create rearing environments for their children that foster education. So you have books at home, they do send you to extra lessons, they tell you school is important, they have expectations and aspirations for you. So yes, there's a whole cluster thing that comes together, and family background necessarily includes genetics, because that's what you get from your parents. Tom, you want to yeah, I mean, the, the elephant in the room here, as often in polite sort of mid-morning Saturday conversations, is sex. And um, 
Finally, we're going to I just thought I'd cut to the chase. Um, and so the, the, the class idea is really also an idea around population structure. Um, you know, in putting to one side what your values might be in terms of how you interpret um, socioeconomic structuring. Um, there's bound to be some population structural effects in terms of who you meet and who you get to reproduce with. And that will, of course, um, contain certain kinds of genetic effects for a period of time, but they are, as the question in fact inferred, um, not necessarily robust in terms of um, breeding regimes. But put it another way, you know, um, in terms of responsibility, I, my, my wife and I went to some considerable length to choose one another and then to, <laughs> then to reproduce, and that choice was not um, solely based on... Um, socioeconomic markers, it would also be based on markers around, the, um, I hope, <laughs> intelligence and that kind of stuff. So people match. There's all kinds of um, breeding and population structural things that you need to think about in the background before you start allocating responsibilities out. That's our business. That's what we do. Yes, I, I think we have to think about the politics a little bit and about the social changes. When we think about class, for example, in this country and in many other places, think about, what, uh, about the 18th century. Think about the early 19th century. Most, uh, the vast, uh, a huge amount, number of people were uh, poor working class. And these people today are here, sitting here. Uh, the, the offspring of these people are sitting here. So... You know, so I think that we have to be extremely careful about the uh, mm. genetics, uh, the genetics of class, and the, uh, the, 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 the how they determine uh, education and other traits. Determine is not the word. Well, not the determine. Word. Okay, no... influence. Influence. We are very careful, but so of course you can say, well, of course there are other influences, and apparently they must be greater because here we are sitting in, uh, sitting here and uh, listening to nature nurture kind of uh, uh, mm. uh, 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 debates. Also about sex. If we're thinking about sex, for a very long time there were very good arguments in the 19th century explaining why, why women are inferior. They have, well, they didn't know that at the time, but we do have two X chromosomes and why have, uh, males have a, a XY. We, are, uh, we have a smaller brain. They, are all, they, they gave very, very good arguments to explain why, unfortunately, women cannot achieve as, as much as men. This argument convinced many, many people. We know today that this argument was not as good as the, the 19th century people thought. So this is the science of so, nature and nurture going yes, badly wrong. Yes, this is exactly it, and we have to be very, very careful about these things. I think that those, all these inputs where, that I have been talking about, I'm, I'm a geneticist. I'm not uh, trying to belittle the genetic influence on, on development and on every aspect of development. I think there is always an input there. But, but there are other inputs, and the interactions between them are very, very complex, and, very, uh, 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 and, and, they can, and, and as many, many experiments have shown, you can mask genetic effects in all kinds of ways, deleterious effects, I mean. So I think that if we're not, talk, if we're not thinking about uh, sociology and if we're not talk, thinking about political science, we will not get very far in understanding where we are and how we are, so and why we are the way we are. Popular view at the LSE, I think. So, so, so just, I mean, that, that, that dovetails onto the stuff you were saying previously about the possibility that cultural processes are kind of a separable evolutionary component. Not entirely separable, no, well, to, to some extent. To, 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 but to, in a significant degree, potentially. Yes. So, so you could then potentially argue that um, concepts of class and the kind of sexism that you've just um, reminded <laughs> us of from the 19th century and, else, and other times is in a sense a cost of that kind of cultural liberty because it's not based on anything real. Do any of you have any thoughts on that, <laughs> um, that issue about uh, how our beliefs about nature and nurture well, kind of feed back into, into yeah. the, the, the science of it? Well, yeah, I mean, in a sense, that's what I'm trying to, to indicate, that um, if you have the potential for a kind of runaway set of beliefs that are not tethered to anything... Yeah. It's biologically kind of leverageable, then, then yeah, you could right. start to make a range of theories. A society that really believed in genetic determinism could, could in a way, make it, make it true, you know, that if everyone, well, everyone's no, genes were, were sequenced at birth and then your opportunities were restricted. There is a slight problem that the idea of genetic determinism is also a cultural product. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah. you know, we're, we're all kind of basically agreeing that cultural determinism isn't true. It's culturally invented that mm. in its very strict sense. I mean, we all think there's genetic yeah. effect. 
Um, so we, the thought experiment kind of couldn't get off the ground in a way because both of those situations are cultural mm. situations and both of them are wrong. We're, so you'd expect their fitness to average out equally across both not, populations. Yeah, we're not living in that society, but it's interesting to imagine how, how a widespread belief in genetic determinism might actually change the facts on the ground. It's in, in line with Eva's point that we need to be careful about how readily we, yeah. we accept claims about the genetic influence. You know, there was a, a, a thought experiment by uh, Thomas Mettinger, who is a philosopher of, of, the, of mind, and he was Im trying to imagine a society in which people didn't believe in free will. I'm not, talking, I'm not arguing now whether free will exists or doesn't exist. The belief in it is very important. So just, be, just imagine that there are people who do not believe in free will. Yeah. What, kind of, what, what kind of morality will these people have? Will they be moral beings if they don't believe so that, they have, the th that they have the freedom of choice? Our philosophical beliefs can feed back into... Yes, exactly. I mean, it will, it will, be, it will become a terrible society. So I'll take a few more uh, questions soon, but uh, before that I want to delve a bit deeper into this question of epigenetics and how epigenetics has the potential to change the way we think about the relationship between nature and nurture, perhaps. I mean, Eva, this is really your specialty. Do you want to tell us, first of all, what epigenetics is and what epigenetic inheritance is? Yes, so, you know, epigenetics is one of these uh, words that uh, are used in many, many different ways. So every time that uh, I write about it, I have to qualify to explain what I'm talking about. So, what I will, so I will not go into the history of it. It's very interesting. But, and it's, it, it underwent many changes during the last 50, 60 years. But the epigenetics, as most people will define it today, I think is the study of developmental processes in all kinds of organisms that lead to persistent and self-maintaining changes in the, the state of these organisms, in the components of these organisms, mm. like cells and organs, and also in lineages of organisms. Mm. So this is this, this epigenetic studies these mechanisms. And it's this idea mechanisms that in, of yeah. persistence. Inheritance is more than just DNA. That's no, now epigenetic inheritance yeah. is a ver, is an aspect of epigenetics. It's mm -hmm. not the same as epigenetics, mm -hmm. the, and the term usually uh, refers to the transmission to subsequent generations of phenotypic variations of variations not in the genes but in in the phenotype, which is the uh, manifestation, the the. the uh, the, the kind of the behavior, yes. the traits, yeah. whatever we see at the macroscopic level, or more macroscopic level, uh, that, that it's to, so it's the transmission to subsequent generations of these traits, phenotypic traits, that do not stem, and variations in these uh, traits that do not stem from variations in DNA-based sequence. That's all. So DNA is important always. We won't be, nobody would be here without DNA. But the question is, are variations in DNA responsible for variations in height, in every other trait? Mm. And if, if yes, to what extent? So epigenetic inheritance, uh, 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 epigenetic inheritance uh, people who think and work on epigenetic inheritance are working at all kinds of levels. For example, they are looking at epigenetic inheritance within the body. Mm. For example, cancer cells, the kind of cancerous Phenotype, the, the cancerous state, is, is due not only to genetic changes, but also, as we learn, to epigenetic changes. And these are transmitted through the lineage of cancer cells. They are also talking about transmission of these epigenetic ch uh, variations from one generation to the next. There is a lot we don't know about how it happens, but there is a lot of evidence that it does happen, especially, the evidence is especially strong mm. in, uh, in, uh, in plants. And it is uh, also quite strong in some small worms and in many other, uh, and, but there is also evidence for it in mammals. And there is some evidence, not very much, that it exists in human beings too, the reason that we have so little evidence for it in human beings is that it is very, very difficult to study it. Can you the, give us an example of, of what you think is, is evidence of it happening in human beings? Well, it's, you know, there is a, a there are transgenerational effects uh, of, uh, that 
last for more than one generation, not just from the mother to the child, but also yeah. to the grandchild, of effects of uh, nutrition, starvation, for example. Again, it's a very complicated, uh, it's a very complicated example, and you know, it's impossible to go into all the intricacies of it. Is there a Another simple version is, of the example? Uh, I can, uh, there, is a simple, there are simple uh, versions of this example, but not in humans. Hmm. There are experiments in mice and in rats, which are yeah. very, very good and very convincing. In humans, we see, in, in mice and rats, we can sort of tease apart the so genetic and the, the epigenetic. The food and we can control the to the rats, you yes. sort of malnourish the rats. We can, we can control the conditions exactly. We can control the genetics exactly. They can be more, what, more or less what we call almost genetically identical, an inbred line. So we can rule out mm. that genetic differences really so contribute it's, it's when the, when and the so parent is, is sort of uh, malnourished the child ends up more vulnerable to obesity for example this is one thing that happens also that it depends how malnourished you are and at yeah. what period during pregnancy the malnourishment happens all these things affect the development of the offspring but and in some at, and at least from the experiments in mice and rats and we're not that different from them Mm. Uh, although we are, of course, we are much more long-lived and so on, but nevertheless, there is a lot of similarities, and we have to remember in, that a lot of what we... In the great scheme of things, we're yes. not that different from rats. <laughs> yeah. Compared to plants so, and worms. I, I think one important point, perhaps, to make here is that um, genetics or DNA is actually quite systematic and simplistic. Um, there's, a, there's a specific language in which DNA is written, and there's a systematic way in which it codes for information. There's a systematic way in which it is transcribed, and we know these mechanisms. So it's we the know same how this works. Same code. Yeah. Exactly. What we don't know is how this works for the environment at all. We don't have a unit of measurement because environments tend to come in many different ways and forms. Uh, we don't have a pathway of transmission. We don't know how an environment that is part of why epigenetics is so difficult, we don't know what a, man, uh, a lack of nutrition actually then does. We can tell you in the large scheme of things, but the systematic pathway that we can map out very easily for the genome, not that we can say how it leads to behavior directly, but we can map out the steps from the genetics to the biology. We can't do this for the environment very well yet. And that's part of why these studies are so difficult. And I, for one, suspect that we are still a long way away from doing this in humans with very solid and robust support for epigenetic effects, which is not to say that they don't exist. It's just very, very difficult to pin down empirically. Well, there is good evidence for it in uh, mice and rats. And uh, some of the pathways are beginning to be better understood. So we know that there are certain types of modifications of DNA that are important, and that these modifications do not change the sequence, the, uh, the so base it's sequence. It's a marker. It's a kind of tag. Markers. It's a kind mm. of tag you put on DNA. These tags are, can be influenced by environmental conditions and can be passed on, tra mm. transmitted. So we know that, but this is just one mechanism. You are very right in that the epigenetic mechanisms that are responsible for this transgenerational inheritance, they're, they're, it's not one simple mechanism. There are, there are several of them, and they interact. And it's di really difficult to study them. So I agree that we don't have enough mm. data as yet about it, but we are learning very, very fast, yeah. especially through model organisms such as worms, such as plants, and such as mice and rats. Tom? There's what, I mean, I, you know, this is more your field than my own, but one, one of the ways that you might look to get into trying to understand epigenetics um, it would be to actually try and narrow the framework a bit before we kind of delve into the mechanisms. And another limitation on the mechanisms is, of course, the ethics of the kinds of experiments you'd like to do. That we can't um, do on human children. No, we can't do them on sort of children. experiments we can do on yeah. plants and worms. But what, we, what is interesting is the fact that it's not necessarily um, an, an ever-present developmental mechanism across taxa, which yes. was being indicated. Yes. So some kind of ecological analysis of when you might expect so that to emerge. So much more important in some species than in others. Yeah, and it would be very interesting, um, and maybe somebody's doing this, I'm sort of half-minded to get around to doing it, to try and do some kind of um, phyletic, phylogenetic analysis of where you see particular kinds of epigenetic mechanisms emerging at least, um, 
mm. in the, the great kind of scheme of things, as you phrased it just now, um, would give you some indication of when these things might have been selected for, because ultimately they, they have been selected for. So it sounds like problems. it's fair to say that the science of epigenetic inheritance is at a fairly early stage. There's still quite a bit of controversy about how important it is in humans. But can I ask, I mean, supposing it does turn out to be extremely important in humans, what would follow for the way we think about nature and nurture? I mean, one fear you might have is that it creates this whole new way in which parents can be responsible for their children's traits because, you know, if you had a period of malnourishment, for example, suddenly your child is more prone to obesity. It's a whole new type of, of worry, isn't it? No, it might, might cause people to realise finally that the nature-nurture distinction is just a category error, that nurture is something that happens in nature and it's patterned and it happens for good reason. And Do you think the whole distinction between nature and nurture would, uh, would just no longer be useful if epigenetic I've, thought, I've never thought important. it's been useful ever. I mean, that's my kind of um, entire career decision, um, because it is a category error. If you just think about baseline nurturing as parenting, for example, which has obviously come up, that's you know, sticking food inputs into a system, and sticking thermo, th thermo sort of inputs into a system, keeping them warm, basically, stopping them getting predated. That's kind of the basic rule for parenting. Um, that is put, you know, taking care of systems. They respond to the food in inputs and the nutrition in particular ways, and they grow in particular ways. As a parent, you're designed to make those decisions. It, this is all part of a more um, general systemic view of life. To ca start parceling them out immediately runs you up against the potential for attaching cultural beliefs to them, which is where the problems come from. And I, I try and avoid that um, through my day-to-day -day life. You just need to know what actually happens before you can make any kind of decisions on that front. But knowing that it's a, a false dichotomy would be extraordinarily useful to civilization, I would think. <laughs> I mean, Sophie, how do you, you think your view of nature and nurture would change if epigenetic inheritance turns out to be a substantial factor? I don't, just think, don't think it will. I don't think it, <laughs> it Well, I have my doubts, but that's a personal thing. Everyone has their beliefs, right? Um, I don't think it would make a fundamental change because ultimately what we are, I see it as part of the mechanisms of the interplay between genes and environment. Yeah, you think they if interact it, already? So. If it plays an important role, um, we would be able to use it as a systematic predictor the same way we are using genetics as a systematic predictor today. What we have to ask ourselves then is what do we want with that prediction? Is this actually going to be useful or problematic? Um, ultimately in psychology our, our overarching aim is to identify how to make people's lives better and I see the utility of prediction in that context. Not everybody's cup yeah, of tea. Yeah, totally I totally sound sceptical of the idea that the aim is to make people's lives better. But ultimately, <laughs> I ultimately don't think that epigenetics would... Epigenetic effects are very much um, a principal mechanism that is hugely accepted by geneticists. The question is just how important is it and how can we pin it down? Hmm. Yeah. I mean, Eva, what do you think the consequences would be if science eventually shows that epigenetic inheritance is important in humans? Well, I think, uh, I, I don't think it's a question of responsibility. I think that uh, mm. once we realize that, we will understand... So you don't think it would be fair to hold parents responsible, for example, uh, for I don't think parents are, I, You know, if you're thinking about the, the favelas in Brazil, for example, yes, are the parents responsible for what is happening to their kids? No. It's a... Uh, so it's a social system. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, 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 it's a political question. Again, it's a social question. It's a political question. So in some cases, yes, I mean, if, if people will behave very, very irresponsibly and they can do uh, otherwise, you will hold them responsible in the same way that you hold them responsible for all kinds of crimes they commit against society. So if they, so, so if they are aware of, the, are aware of the, the, the damage that, they are, that, the, that their actions can, can lead to, then you can hold them responsible. But in most cases, this is not the case. This is, a, first of all, a political question, and, it's, uh, and it, it has to have a political impact in the same way that our realization that, uh, that, uh, that we are ruining the environment has to lead to political action. It's very, very similar in terms of the way in which it should affect... Yeah. Uh, so these uh, questions uh, are inherently political. You yes. can't I think a lot, of, a lot of the actual things that we can... If, if we find out that epigenetics is very, very important in determining the way that people develop and so, and, uh, it, 
also in, in terms of cognitive development. Then we have, then, then we as individuals, but even more so the society, has a responsibility to do something about it. And also it will lead to all kinds of uh, to, to predictions and to ways of uh, uh, ameliorating these effects. Because one of the things that we do know about epigenetic inheritance is, yes, there is epigenetic inheritance, but th this is not, doesn't mean to say that there is a, a epigenetic determinism or environmental determinism. We, c we know that we can switch the effects of uh, uh, epigenetic variations and that they, are, that they can be reversed. And these experiments, again, have been, have been made in mice. So mm -hmm. people have shown, for example, that you can stress the mother and the pups in mice during the first 14 days of, uh, after she has given birth to them. And this leads to a lot of uh, problems in the offspring and also in, the, uh, in their offspring and in their grand offspring. So it goes on for two, uh, for, for two generations. However, if you take this mice, the, and, and this was done by, uh, you, people were looking at, uh, at males because, it, uh, be, because the transmission through the males is relatively easier to follow because males only trans transmit sperm, whereas females transmit not only oocyte but also the effects of the womb and so on and so forth and early care. And mice, the male doesn't do very much, mm. except, uh, <laughs> except gives a little Just bit of Just reinforcing that yeah. point of mice and humans, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, anyway, but so, so they took this, so this mice, so they looked at the male mice, and the male mice were stressed, and they were psychotic, and they were, you know, really uh, very bad mental state as far as mice go. And their offspring were like that, and their grand offspring. And then, but then if you take this mice, and you give them, again, an enriched and interesting environment, it goes away, and the epigenetic, and the epigenetic effect goes away. And their offspring are okay, so, so we can reverse it. Effects. They're yeah. controllable. Yes, they're controllable. controllable, and we can do something about it, and that would be great. It would be fantastic at this point to take another round of questions from the audience. We'll take three again. Let's start from the middle of the front row here. Um, Hi, thank you. Uh, a basic question, if I may. Uh, if we think about how a species will evolve in the future versus how it has evolved uh, in the past, Given the evidence of the importance of the environment, do you think there's an, there's an argument that in the future it's much more in our control, given that we control our environment much more now than we used to, say, you know, 10,000 years ago when natural selection was kind of more of a thing than it is now? Just interested mm. in your thoughts on that. Thanks. And there was a question from the person next to you as well. Um, and then I'll go to Rose yeah, further back. Right. Hi, uh, thank you very much. Um, do you think that morality is genetic or epigenetic, if, if there is any such thing as morality in genetics at all? Thanks, great. And okay, let's let the uh, third person on the front row also ask his question. But I have to be fair to the other rows, so we'll then take some more from further back. Thank you. Uh, I have two questions, one, one to Sophie uh, and other to Professor Eva. Uh, question to Sophie. Uh, I, I find it really interesting that you blame uh, uh, Mendel for the kind of perception we have built uh, regarding what can be changed and what cannot be changed regarding genetics. And my question is, are, are you saying that if, if, there, is, if there are two people uh, of one color, can they produce a child of a different color changing environment or any other parameter? You know, if, if you believe that genetic is not exactly trans, uh, transferred to the, uh, to the next generation. And my other question is, uh, uh, to Professor uh, Eva that you mentioned that, you know, the kind of perception we had regarding the capabilities of sex during 19th or 20th century was wrong based on studies now. So my question is, how would I believe what is being studied now or what is being said by you if scientists follow quantitative or qualitative research methods? Thank you. Thanks, great. And let's take one from towards the back of the room. So there's a question there from five rows from the back. Please wait for the microphone to come to you. And we'll take uh, a fifth question as well, and then we'll give you a chance to respond to all five. Hi. So uh, my question has to do with more um, how an anthropologist would look at this situation. So I study uh, biosocial medical anthropology at UCL, and it's essentially talking about nature versus nurture and the epigenetics argument. So it's kind of we're more on the epigenetic side. The reason why I say that is that culture very much gets under the skin. Um, so we look at 
For example, Native Americans in the States, um, they have higher prevalence of chronic illness, and you can see that epigenetically. You can also see that intergenerationally, how trauma is passed down. You also see that with uh, grandchildren of World War II victims. So um, I'm just kind of thinking about the take on that in terms of nature versus nurture argument and epigenetics. Uh, yeah, that's my only question. Thanks. And another question from uh, towards the back. There's, there's one from the three rows from the back over there. Please wait for the microphone to come to you. And then that's going to be all we have time for, I'm afraid. Great to see so many questions. I just wanted to ask, um, to what extent are like animal studies and like bird studies applicable to the nature of nurture understanding in terms of humans? Because we can see, like, in a lot of different aspects of psychology, there's a limit to there's a, like an extent to where you can only apply them, and then after that, you, you can't actually generalize them completely. So that's my question. Thank you. Thanks very much. Yes, yeah, some great questions there. I mean, a question about whether natural selection is a much less important force in influencing human behaviour than it used to be. A question about how debates about nature and nurture apply specifically to morality and where morality comes from. A question about why we should believe what, specifically what you say, Eva, apparently, um, in light of the fact that our views about nature and nurture have changed so much over the past hundred years. Um, a question about uh, how debates about nature and nurture might play out in particular cases, like that, that case involving Native Americans. And a question about how reliably we can project from non-human animals to humans, which seems to be a huge part of research in this area. So I'd like to invite thoughts on any of those issues. Should we start with you, Eva? You were most well, directly uh, challenged there. Yes, I think uh, you have to be skeptical of what I say. You have to be skeptical. <laughs> I mean, you have to be skeptical. I, I am skeptical. I mean, uh, I, I, I all the time ch try to challenge myself and try to see whether the experiments are really good. What do they mean? What do they? Are they stretched too much in terms of, the, of their implications? And I, you know, if, if, if somebody told me many, many years ago that this kind of field of epigenetics, I remember when I first heard about a particular type of epigenetic, uh, uh, of epigenetic mechanism that was discovered in the end of the, 90, uh, of the 1990s. It was something called small RNAs. When I read about it, I couldn't believe it. I had to read this paper like five times and I felt like I, I was Alice in Wonderland. It, it, I re, it, it, it was co so completely bizarre and so completely unexpected for me that it took me a very long time to actually believe it, to actually absorb it. To, to, and I then after that, I read every paper about it. So one has to be skeptical, of course. But on the other hand, there, there is some evidence, and we cannot just ignore it because we're skeptical. We cannot say, well... Everything changes, so there is some progress in science. We understand a lot more about genetics, for example, than we did 100 years ago. And now we are beginning to see that there is more to heredity than the heredity of DNA variation, so we have to understand it. We are still at the beginning, but we need to. So, and we have to take seriously the good experiments, those experiments that actually show that this, is, this phenomenon actually exists. And we have Short to on time, I'd like to hear from the, the other panelists as well on these questions. Uh, I'll start with morality. Um, <laughs> Good. Uh, the big question. Um, I'm not entirely clear quite where you were driving with it, whether you were trying to seek some kind of story about the genetic determinants of particular kinds of moral position. But I guess the way I would come into it would be to say you would like to think what moral behaviour might be. And one of the kind of uh, popular views in behavioural biology is that moral behaviours are solutions to social coordination problems, and that's really about kind of maximising your utilities within a population. Um, and then there are discussions about selection for particular kinds of um, social cognitions, for example, that might deliver um, good utilities in those kinds of games. It's generally modelled game theoretically. Um, and they seem to be quite stable, and there are sort of patterns to the kinds of responses that you'd expect to see. You could, of course, upset the apple cart by completely changing um, resource parameters within particular games, and people's behaviour might flip-flop. And then you would probably see quite interesting individual differences in people's sensitivity to tracking those and how they take 
uh, risks or don't in terms of... It's a sort of huge budget. ongoing debate, isn't it's it, massive, really? Yeah. Whether there are Sorry. moral <laughs> universals that are shared across cultures and that have to be explained with some sort of evolutionary explanation, yeah. or whether morality varies enormously from one culture to the next, yeah. and the explanations are largely cultural. Yeah, um, and I, I think that, 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 that debate is actually largely kind of um, driven by where you choose to focus. Um, and that, that's really what's lurking in the back of this whole discussion. And you, you made this point earlier, that whilst we're pretty clear on how we measure genetic variation, we really have no idea how to partition variation at any other level that's meaningfully mappable in a neat and tidy way. Yeah. And that, that creates all kinds of difficulties for our interpretations of these things. And Sophie, your responses to these questions? Um, I, I would come back um, to the questions of beliefs and interpretation because I do think um, that is the fundamental domain that is relevant to epigenetics and nature and nurture in general. Um, we, we may even have good evidence for certain things already, but we don't trust them or we don't believe them or we interpret them in the wrong way. And the reason I come to this is because we mentioned um, women and women's change in position in society over the past 100, 200 years. Um, but the fundamental assumption that people still hold today at occasion, I have heard, but that was more prominent in former times, that women for genetic or biological reasons are systematically inferior to men. And we see that they have caught up, perhaps not perfectly, perhaps there's still a gender pay gap, perhaps there's still Elizabeth Warren that just withdrew from the race. Um, so we have to see this in the context. Uh, what strikes me as a fascinating contradiction is that for the past hundred years, psychological science would be broadly described as environmentalist, with the fundamental assumption being that the experiences that we make in our day-to-day -day lives, the things that happen to us, inform how our minds work. Yet at the same time, we hesitate no second to say a woman is fundamentally different to a man for her biology, and that these biological genetic differences translate into differences in the mind. So we live permanently with a perverted sense of dualism. <laughs> I'd just like to close with basically a yes or no question, which is do you think Never that we idea. will still be debating nature and nurture in a hundred years' time? <laughs> Sadly, yes. Sadly, yes. <laughs> I would be unemployed if no. Yes, absolutely. And it's important. It's still yes, but not sadly, and ever. I think we'll be asking it in such a different way mm. that it will not mm. be the same uh, question anymore. You think those categories of nature and nurture will have I gone? Don't, yeah, I don't know if they will be gone, but I think that we will uh, be much more uh, specific about what we are asking. So if we're asking about uh, why somebody is uh, an alcoholic, for example, we will ask about what... Uh, well, that's better and more precise questions. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And this, but these questions are important. Yeah. Well, on that note, I mean, thanks to all three of you and thanks to everyone in the audience for your great questions. All that remains is to thank our panel for a fascinating discussion. Thank you.